from Columbus, Georgia, and I've been living in Atlanta for many years. We are at the Atlanta History Center on April 5th, 2004. Would you please introduce yourself and, and tell us, uh, were you drafted or did you enlist in the military? Well, Lynn, it's nice to meet a, a Columbusite. Since I was born in Columbus, Georgia myself, on March the 3rd, 1916. And I'm a real Columbus product because I went to the grammar schools there. I went to Columbus High School, graduated class of 1932. And uh, my father sold horses, and he was a livestock dealer for 50 years in Columbus, Georgia. And we had a big farm on the Chautauqua Road where some about 300 white-faced cattle. And, uh, and I spent one year there before I went to the University of Georgia because I was only 16. And I graduated law school in 1938 at the University of Georgia and was commissioned in the Army in 1937. Uh, I practiced law, and uh, I was in a judge's uh, office, Judge George C. Palmer, uh, who, whose father was a, a Confederate soldier, and he wouldn't let his son go to that Yankee school at West Point. And uh, he had, uh, so he had some military connections there. Uh, I uh, volunteered for the Army. I volunteered in 1940 in June. And then I went on active duty a uh, year or so later. Uh, I, um, uh, I guess people say, well, what? I, I was in the Army about a year and a half or so before Pearl Harbor. I was not drafted. I was not called up. But I had some very strong feelings about World War II, uh, particular with Adolf Hitler and what he stood for, because it was so contrary to everything that I believed in. And uh, my folks uh, were immigrants. I'm a first-generation American, and they lived in Russia, and they were they were uh, uh, persecuted so badly, and and uh, they uh, came to the United States of America about 19. And I think it's worth telling because when I was growing up, my mother would say over and over, uh, Aaron, you know how lucky you are to be an American. And I grew up with the feeling that um, this was the greatest country on earth and it was worth saving and there was no other country on earth like our country and so uh, I felt like at that time the Germans had swept down uh, through the lowlands and captured Paris and uh, I couldn't sit still any longer so I went to Judge Palmer and I told him I wanted to go in the I was going to go in the army and you know he wanted me to get me a, a place in Washington he was a great friend of Senator Walter George and all and I said, no, no, uh, I, just, I want to get uh, served with troops. I had already had some ROTC training at Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. At that, that time, we still had horses. We had horse cavalry. And, of course, my dad sold horses, and I'd been riding a horse since I was about seven years old, so I wanted to be in the cavalry. Um, I, I had visions that I would probably go to the Texas border, uh, perhaps to Fort Bliss or uh, Fort Huachuca out in Arizona or the Presidio in California. Uh, and I had visions of that because that was cavalry country along the, those borders. And uh, of course the Philippine Scouts uh, was a cavalry regiment, but they were completely wiped out uh, during the Japanese invasion of Luzon. And it's very fortunate I wasn't sent there. The reason I'm telling this story is because I was very chagrined when I received orders to go to Fort Benning, Georgia, to, uh, to a new uh, motorized division called the 4th Infantry Motorized Division. That's the same division that captured Saddam Hussein in Iraq today. So it was a great division, and I was with them uh, uh, from, from 40 to 43. But the reason I tell the story is that if there was a humorous episode, because when I reported for active duty, 
there was a, 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 a finance corporal, and he looked at me and said, Lieutenant Cohn, I don't know what kind of soldier you're going to make, but you're going to have a unique distinction. I said, what is that? He said, you're going to get the lowest transportation of anybody I ever heard of in the United States Army, and here's your transportation money. Eight cents a mile, eight miles, here's your 64 cents. <laughs> That is very interesting. Yes, it was. Columbus, I know for yeah, well. Yes. And so I was chagrined because everybody had told me goodbye, you know, and uh, and I envisioned I was going to ride off to the deep west or something like that, and here I was riding home. But it had some great advantages because I had a, a wonderful family and I enjoyed being in Columbus, Georgia. It was my home. I'm sure your parents were thrilled. Yeah, they were. They were to have me at home. and. Uh, and as you well know, uh, Lynn, how Columbus was, we, we had special places we went to. The old courthouse was built in 1895, uh, and you know, right up the street was Spano's Restaurant, where everybody in Columbus who knew Columbus went. And um, all my friends were there, so I didn't mind it at all. And uh, we, uh, this was a new division, and it was very, very new. And uh, it was a, a motorized division where they had what we call three regimental combat teams. And as a cavalry officer, though, I was in an infantry division, and I, and by volunteering, I hurt my, myself because most of my classmates waited for the call-up. And the call-up that came with the people in the armored cavalry, which was my combat branch, uh, I never, I, I never, uh, tried to transfer into the, uh, at one time I was, uh, uh, I just uh, decided I was going to stay with my branch and not try to go into the judge advocate's office. And so I stayed in the combat branch. Uh, my, uh, uh, my friends were called up in, uh, in February of 1941. And they went with different armor divisions. They went with the history of armor. Uh, they went and uh, they were called up in February, and they went to the second armor division, and the first armor division, and the third armor division, and the fourth, because the armor division was a new concept. It, it was something that the Germans had showed us in the Blitzkrieg, that it, with a combination of tanks and infantry, and and met the, uh, different attached engineers. They were what we call the Einheit theory. They were able to uh, fight much better by having uh, a unit such as this because they had all the elements they needed. They had the support elements and the combat elements all working together. And the United States learned a great lesson from the Germans because the Germans had uh, uh, had 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 uh, obliterated nine Polish horse cavalry divisions in one week. And so those people who talked about the horse, uh, we, they, uh, the horse, they said, would never come back. But we found that not to be true later on when we crossed the Alps in, in Yugos, uh, Yugoslavia because it depends upon the terrain. But armor was the name of the game, and we were just in our infancy in armor. So my classmates made much quicker, rapid uh, 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 ex uh, advancements in rank while I was sort of stuck in an infantry division. We have what we call a table of organizations, and if there's no place for you, you just didn't go there because uh, uh, you were not able to go into a position where you, d you got a promotion. There had to be a position there. In, in the infantry division, there was only about six spots for six cavalry officers, while in an army division, there was just oh, all kinds of uh, 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 org organizational uh, positions to hold. But I was with the 4th Division, and when Pearl Harbor hit, it was um, on a Sunday. Uh, my wife and I were married uh, 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 before Pearl Harbor. We were married on June the 19th, 1941, at the old Harmony Club in Columbus, Georgia. And uh, 
Uh, her name was Janet Ann Lilienthal, and her, her parents uh, had a beautiful uh, lady store in Columbus, Georgia. And I mention that because after the war was over and my wife's brother was killed in combat, Leslie Lilienthal Jr., and he's buried in Brittany today uh, in the Brittany Cemetery uh, at St. James, France. And he was killed in September the 13th, 1944, while fighting around uh, Fort Carinero in Brest, France. Because at that, when I came back, they wanted me to go into this beautiful store, but I was not a merchant. There was not a merchant in my family, and uh, I had been a lawyer before, and I just hung up my shingle and and uh, and went from there. And I, I think bought, I bought many beautiful dresses. Yes. And Casa Lilienthal, in fact, your daughter Gail and I ended up wearing the same exact gown to our high school graduation that we purchased there. Fortunately, they were different colors. Well, uh, not to deviate, uh, I'm going to tell that because uh, I thought uh, when, I, when I mentioned my wife's name, that uh, that sort of puts a tag on her. We've we've been married now 63 years, and had uh, three wonderful children. Uh, Gail was born when I was at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, and I was still uh, I was not with the Fourth Division when I went to, to Leavenworth, but I went to the. Uh, in 1943, uh, after our division it had been on all kinds of maneuvers, South Carolina maneuvers, Tennessee maneuvers, uh, uh, you um, you never knew when you were going to go overseas, but I was waiting to go overseas. Uh, when uh, the chief of staff of the 4th Division called me in and said, um, uh, Aaron, uh, in the meantime, they, every time I had a, a spot uh, for promotion, uh, they increased our uh, uh, reconnaissance troop to a reconnaissance battalion. But every time I was ready for a promotion, uh, the division headquarters uh, knew that I was a lawyer and I had done some court martial work. They would put me on special duty and I was trying all kinds of military cases. If you fell asleep on post in the 4th Infantry Division, that was 14 years at Leavenworth. Not the school, but the penitentiary there, because uh, falling asleep on post, even, even in, uh, it was wartime, but even in the United States, there was no, um, there was no excuse for that, and they felt like uh, you were not a good risk, and they punished you very badly, and many, uh, many a soldier that I prosecuted, and I prosecuted them, uh, many a soldier that I prosecuted had turned to me and said, you SOB, if I ever see you again, I, and you better look behind you because I'm going to blow your head off. But uh, I wasn't worried about that at all. Uh, but I was with the 4th Division from 1940 to 1943, and they had not uh, gone over seasons at the time. Later on, it was my, my division that landed with four other American divisions on D-Day. The 4th Division, the 29th Division, uh, the 1st Division, and I think it was the, the Bloody Buckets, the, the 28th Division out of, out of um, uh, Pennsylvania. Is our call. Uh, I knew the other three divisions, two divisions, very well, but the fourth one, uh, no, it was the 29th Division. Uh, that was the division that my brother in law was killed in. Uh, they suffered terrific casualties in World War II. So I, I went to the 3rd Cavalry. Uh, this was uh, General Patton's own regiment. He commanded this regiment at Fort Myer, Virginia. And they were a horse uh, division. Uh, I mentioned horses because the Germans, later on, we found out their field artillery was not self-propelled. Self-propelled means it, it's on tracks and it moves much better. <coughs> the Germans never followed that concept, and we often wondered why. Because horse-drawn, they had horse-drawn artillery. And horse-drawn artillery is very vulnerable when it's pulling out of position. They are sitting ducks. And that's the way it worked. But uh, after the, uh, I, I was uh, 
went to the to the third cavalry. General Patton, of course, became a brigadier general, and he was um, at the Second Army Division right there in Columbus, at, uh, in the Sand Hill area. The Fourth Division originally was on the other side, and they made them the t the 10th Tank Battalion, and they gave us the regimental colors. Uh, these colors went back to 1846. The 3rd Cavalry was, my regiment had a great esprit, a great traditional history. It was activated in 1846 and fought valiantly in the, in the Mexican War. They were the ones that stormed the heights at Chapultepec. And there's a big mural. If you go to Mexico City, you'll see that mural of the American troops storming the heights of Chapultepec. I've seen that. Yes, and that was my regiment. I didn't tell anybody in Mexico that I used to be in the Third Cavalry. But uh, uh, that was General Patton's old, old, old regiment, and he loved our regiment. Uh, um, as a matter of fact, it, it received practically no publicity, and uh, he's he's uh, long gone. Uh, but I'll never forget when we he commanded the Third Army, and um, when we hit uh, the UK. Uh, in the meantime, I had gone to the infantry school. Uh, even though I was with the cavalry regiment, I was the only cavalry officer at the infantry school in my class. About 99 guys were infantry, and I was cavalry. And I received a lot of ribbing about being the only cavalry officer. But I wanted to go there instead of going to go to Fort Raleigh. Remember any of your instructors in particular? Well, I, the only instructor I remember uh, at, at that particular school was Sergeant Newberry, and uh, one young officer asked uh, about um, how you use uh, how you use those gaffs that go on the uh, inside of your feet, and he said, "Suppose I put them on the outside." I thought you put them on the outside. And he said, well, that's good. If you're in the middle of a hollow tree, you can go up the tree that <laughs> way. But uh, I uh, had had no, um, they were not cavalry officers, so I, I didn't pay too much attention to them or the rank, except that I, it was a great lesson because I became a communication officer when I went back to my regiment. That is an interesting job. Yes. And when I went back to my regiment, uh, I went from there, of course. Uh, I, I, I commanded a, I commanded a, a cavalry troop, and my troop was at. Uh, uh, I had all the old timers. Uh, they were cadred from the Fourth Cavalry uh, at uh, Fort Meade, South Dakota, and they were old old soldiers. And uh, I, I, I can tell you one episode which is indicative of the way I felt about people. I inherited all the old timers and I inherited all the learned people who really knew their stuff. And um, they were the regimental sergeant major, the regimental combat commission officers, uh, uh, operation officer, uh, the intelligence uh, sergeant, all of these people. And uh, I don't know, Lynn, whether you understand Army lingo, but uh, for instance, if you are one, that's a personnel. If you're two, your intelligence. If you're three, your combat operations. I was three of combat operations. Ended up by being the regimental S3 of my regiment. And then four is supply, and five is civil affairs. So at it, it, lower level, you were an S if you were a, a, a battalion or you were a, uh, a, 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 a cavalry regiment which was subordinate to a division. If you were a division level, it would be a G1, G2, G3, G4, or tucked together with the chief of staff. Uh, so uh, I um, went to the cavalry school, the infantry school, and the command general staff school. The command general staff school, I was at Fort Riley, Can uh, at Fort Leavenworth. Uh, in August of uh, 
1943. It was GS-14, and we had about 600 officers. This basically was a nine-month course, but uh, we didn't have time for a nine-month course, and we did it in, in uh, 90 days. And we worked night and day, night and day. So and that's why they tr intense. Yeah. And it was probably very hot. Yeah. And I, I, for people who are in the a academics world, I thought you'd like to know that uh, when if you didn't do well, and they felt like uh, you hadn't done well, and you went to get your papers, uh, it was just a, uh, all they did is uh, there was a little cubby hole where you, you got your, 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 your paperwork, and there was just a little red ribbon right across it, a diagonal, which said, hey, soldier, go back to your outfit. We don't want you. We don't need you. And it was an intensive, and like I said, uh, Gail was, uh, was born uh, while I was gone. Uh, my regiment, uh, let me sort of give you a breakdown in the regiment. Uh, we had two squadrons of cavalry. Uh, each cavalry squadron was uh, one headquarters, uh, was a, a staff of, uh, of uh, the commander of, of the uh, squadron. It was like an infantry battalion, but, but we called it squadrons in the cavalry regiment. And so uh, they, uh, uh, each troop basically had, if, it was, if there were three reconnaissance troops, there was a tank company and what we called an assault gun. We had our own little artillery. They were assault guns. Uh, out, 750 men in each squadron of cavalry. So my, my regiment had about 1,500 people. And you say, well, that's a very small amount of people. But our job basically was like that of Indian scouts. We were to go and find out where the enemy was, or come in contact with them. And once we came in contact with them, we were to engage them in a firefight. Uh, if we, uh, and then if we found out what they were doing, if they were dug in, whether they are uh, on the aggressive side, uh, whether they, uh, there were long lines of, uh, of troops coming in uh, or whatever, we then reported, we would then report that to our uh, general who commanded uh, uh, the Corps. We were what we call core cavalry. We were not part of a division. We were the eyes and ears of the core commander. A core commander, of course, has several divisions. Uh, uh, he would have maybe two infantry divisions and one army division, each division being roughly about 16,000 men. And there were a lot of what we call special army troops, but we were always directly under the command of the Corps commander. And this is important because uh, lots of times uh, uh, if you're attached to infantry divisions sometimes, uh, uh, there were times when infantry divisions did not employ us correct. Uh, not that I saw this happen uh, when we were attached to a division, but I knew of one tank battalion uh, whose, whose infantry regimental commander uh, had them to go into the woods at night. And we are not good at night because uh, we're very vulnerable at night, very vulnerable because Germans can lie in the bushes and use what was called a Panzerfaust and knock us out pretty bad. And in this case, uh, they were about, uh, oh, this, this, this colonel's uh, uh, tank battalion lost more than half. And after it was over, he had a fist fight with the regimental command. He said, you destroyed my command. But at any rate, uh, we had at times served as uh, infantry because we had to dig in in a static situation. But basically, uh, our what we call a school solution uh, on how to employ cavalry was classic in World War II. 
The terrain was marvelous. It had all kinds of roads. The surface was flat. There were no mountains from, uh, uh, from the English Channel all the way back into Berlin or uh, down into the Austrian Alps where we ended the war. It was perfect terrain for, for us. And uh, uh, we, we had the mission, you know, of, uh, of seizing bridges. Uh, uh, we, didn't, we didn't get into action until about D plus, uh, it would be D plus 90 because we went into uh, action in August. Up to that time, it was an infantry mission, uh, an infantry mission to seize the hedgerow countries, the, the hedgerow uh, uh, terrain, because uh, the beaches were not a place for us. We were specialized troops. We were, the, as I said, the eyes and ears of the Corps commander. And the intelligence officer was always in touch with us because we were the ones that found out in so many cases where everybody was, you know, and we were pretty much spread out and uh, we were, would report everything. If there was a blown bridge, if there was uh, enemy infantry dug in, and so when you went back to the situation map, they kept the situation map and, and when they got this build up, they can determine pretty much what the enemy was doing, whether they were in a defensive posture or whether they were in an offensive posture. But we used to say sometimes, uh, the way we were, they said engage them in a firefight and then disengage because they were superior to us in firepower and in equipment. We used to say, yeah, well, what do you do when you got a tiger by the tail? How do you let him go? Can you go back just for a moment and tell us, did you go overseas from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas? No, I went overseas from Boston Harbor. I'm glad you asked that, Lynn. Uh, well, after I came back, then my unit, the 3rd Cavalry, went overseas when I came back. That was 1943. No, it was 43, yes, uh, it was towards the end of 43, or the first part of 44, right in that, that time. And your regiment left from? We left from Fort Gordon, Georgia, where we were. Yeah, the 4th Division, in, in the 3rd Cavalry was activated at Fort Gordon, Georgia. The 10th Armored Division was also there, and also at one time the 4th Division was there. The 4th Division finally moved out, out of there. Did, did you convoy to Boston or fly? No, we, we, put, we got on a train. And we, we, the train carried our tanks and light tanks and, and air equipment and everything uh, to Boston Harbor. And at Boston Harbor, we uh, sailed on the SS uh, Aquitania. She was a ship that came out of Singapore. She was a British ship. And they said we had no flotilla with us, no support at all. She was by herself. Really? Yeah, and she, they told us that she could outrun any U-boat alive. Well, like I said, can she outrun a torpedo? But, now you're saying Aquitania. Yeah, the Aquitania. She was a sister ship, I think, to the Mauritania, the Lusitania, and so forth. That class. Very interesting. And uh, we, uh, we landed at the Firth of Clyde uh, in Scotland. And uh, we got in a, on a little uh, small train, you know, there. The, their tracks were much smaller than our tracks, and we went right on down through the English lowlands, I mean the, the English uh, from Scotland right into Great Britain near the plains of Salisbury. Uh, the plains of Salisbury near the Royal Artillery College. And then when we, when we crossed the channel uh, to France, uh, of course, uh, we didn't hit the, the beaches until about the, until the beaches were secure because that was an infantry operation. It was no so this was about 90 days? Yes, 90 days. August, August is when we started. Well, uh, 
there was an opening, there was a breach in the German lines. There was one thing that I want to tell you about how America is. Um, we were when we hit the beaches, we needed a, uh, a black port battalion to uh, unload us. And um, he, they were not there. The Germans were counterattacking at Mortain. That was M O R T A I N. The Germans had a real counterattack. And the word got out we needed everybody we could to stop that attack and, and knock us off the beaches. And uh, they wanted more and more armor because, you know, it was an infantry operation, and sometimes infantry is, is a very, very difficult for infantry to stop uh, tanks without some, some real good support. Uh, there was not that port battalion to unload us, and so um, I asked the, we was all in an LST run by the Merchant Marine, and I asked this guy from the Merchant Marine, can you guys help us get our stuff off the tanks? Tanks all through him. He looked in his pocket, and as a lawyer, I, I was amazed, because I learned my lesson. He pulls out a sheet of paper and says, have you seen my contract? And I said, what contract? He says, it says here, that we're only to get you to the beaches, and after we get you to the beaches, you're on your own, buddy, just like that. And I said, do we belong to the same country? And that was a great lesson that I learned then about, about uh, people and whether they were really patriotic or not. Uh, it had to have been a very difficult time for you. Yeah, it was a difficult time for us, but the the, battal the port battalion showed up, and uh, we uh, we we landed, of course, <clears throat> in uh, the Firth of Clyde, and then, as I said, and from there, we were about only 30 days were we in um, in the UK. Only 30 days, because they really needed us bad. We had been told, we, you know, uh, our armored vehicles had, um, <laughs> they thought they were su such, we had such great armament. We only had light machine guns on our armored vehicles. We found out that the best weapon to use against the Germans was a 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, we had a chaplain who was marvelous, and he, we had a Catholic chaplain and a Protestant chaplain. And our Protestant chaplain was the biggest scrounger in Europe. You wanted whiskey, you wanted guns. I don't know where he got them from, but he got them for you. And we, uh, 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 we put on 50 caliber machine guns on our armored vehicles. And uh, we had the old light tank that later on was replaced by the patent tank once we hit the country. Where do you think he acquired these? Pardon? 50 millimeter. They were, we, we, I don't know where we got them, but he, he made arrangements to get them because we needed them real bad. And the Army didn't, uh, it was not part of our table of organization, but we made it because we knew that we were going to have to use them. Uh, General Patton was delighted with our regiment. This was his old regiment. This received very little publicity. But my colonel went up to the to see General Patton, and General Patton told him, in effect, according to my colonel, he says, Fred, he says, I'm glad you're here. He said, I've got a mission for you. And my colonel said, what kind of mission? And he says, well, I want you, your regiment, to capture Brest. And my colonel came back, he was very excited, and he told me that that was going to be our mission. you remember that colonel's last name? Well, um, the, the colonel was captured. My first colonel was captured. Colonel Drury was his name. Fred Drury. He was a class of 1918, and uh, he was my regimental commander. He was the first regimental commander. And uh, they told him, uh, they told him, uh, uh, he, was to, he was told, George Patton was a great general, 
a great general. But he loved us, and he wanted to cover us with glory, he said. And my colonel came in and told me he wanted me to start working on the operations of capturing Brest. Well, Brest was uh, where, the, where the submarine pen was. And uh, the Germans had three divisions there, parachute division, uh, the cream of the German Wehrmacht was there. And they only had, see, since it was a peninsula, uh, they uh, had, uh, could uh, guard the terrain in, in great depth because the rest of it was sea. And it was just not far uh, from one side to the other, you know. It jetted out, and then we had that. Well, when my guys found out about that, uh, believe me, everybody who had drawn a will, had not drawn a will, they knew I was a lawyer in civilian life. They wanted me to start drawing wills. Luckily, luckily, it didn't turn out that way because we would have it'd been like the Charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, if that, but I, well, the George was sincere, General Patton was sincere or not, I don't know. But I can only tell you what my 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 colonel told me. Dad, well, that's a wonderful memory. Lynn, the story about a general about Hitler not listening to his officers because you oh. guys were almost all wiped out. Yeah, at, at I will, but that's much that's later down the line. Sorry. That's later Sorry. down the line, honey. Please edit that. Yeah. Uh, uh, we um, uh, at the at, at, if you look at the map, you'll see a little place called Vitra. Uh, we, we went, uh, first we went, when we got on the beaches, we hit St. Marigliese, Laval, Le Mans, and then Vitra. At Vitra, there was a hole. There was a hole. Uh, it was like football, like running off tackle. Map here, if you would like to well, I don't know. Yes, I don't know. You see, you don't show Vitria. It was a small village. But this swing along here, uh, I can only tell you it was a very small place, V-I-T-R-E. We then swung to the, to the, towards Berlin. We headed east. And this is on the way to Brest? Is well, correct? no. On the way to Brest, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't at attack Brest. We bypassed Brest. Brest was bypassed by everybody because it was so ineffective. And the U-boat uh, uh, that came, came from there were not as effective as they were before. And Brest just sat out there like a, a bug on the log because we didn't need Brest anymore. We didn't need Brest anymore because we had uh, we had we were headed towards the east and we simply bypassed Brest. Brest was not in the big picture, and I was not in the big picture. You you could tell uh, if you asked a guy what did you do in the army, and if he told you at what level he served, you knew whether or not he saw his friends killed and whether or not he was uh, in harm's way. And most of the fighting was done uh, by units like my unit in the army divisions and the infantry divisions in the engineer battalions. These were the people that were on the ground. These were the people that saw the little, the little picture. And if you showed them something, on, they, they wanted you to show them something on the map. They would get the, the map, maybe not a one to 100,000, but a, a better map. That, and they would show you, go down this road, you go down that road. But you know, the, the, the big people, and, and they said, we want our cavalry out there, you know, and they were point to the east. And then once they said that's what they wanted, uh, they wanted to a particular sector, they would then give that mission and we worked out all the details. So you're now in Vitra and you're headed east. And we start headed east. We were the right flank, right flank of the United States Army. Okay. Uh, because at that time, the uh, 20th Corps 
that we stayed and always stayed in the 20th Corps, commanded by General Walton Walker, who was later killed in Korea. Because we called him Bulldog Walker. Uh, we were on the right flank of, of, the, of the attack, always, for a long time. How now the Germans. It took you to, I'm sorry. How long did it take you to? Were you riding? Oh, we 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 were in vehicles. We were in vehicles because the 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 crust of the in our area, uh, most of the Germans. It was not heavily fortified. You see, uh, if you further to the north uh, was the Fillet Gap, and uh, and they uh, there was a tremendous American victory at Fillet Gap, and we were uh, south of the Fillet Gap, and we were along we went along the Loire River. The Loire River runs east and west. And we were the right flank of the Loire River. So our route went something like this. We went to, uh, we went to uh, Orléans, and uh, in Orléans, the French women were jumping in our tanks, and I'd yell a message, uh, Major, uh, I got a French, a French girl in my, my vehicle. What do I do with her? I said, throw her butt out of there, because she's not supposed to be in there, you know. But they were giving us the champagne and, you know, the usual, uh, the Viva la Amérique. They, they loved us then. They just adored us, because we were liberating them. Now, mind you, the Germans were still south of us. A million Germans were south of us, my regiment, because there had not been a landing in the Mediterranean. That was came late, later on, with General Patch and the Seventh Army. We were not in the Seventh Army. We were in the Third Army. So the, you had the Third Army and the First Army basically uh, were, were fighting where we were. How many months do you, would you say it took you to get from the coast of France into the I'll tell you, we had a pursuit, and it was like a, a wide receiver running for a touchdown. We, the crust had broken where we were. And we were very fortunate, like God blessed us. And we went from Orléans to Chateau Dun, uh, uh, to uh, Chateau Thierry, uh, to Verdun, and we uh, to Thionville on the Moselle River in about a month. Well, you were moving. We were moving sometimes 60 miles down the road that we had surprised the Germans. Uh, for instance, uh, some, of our, uh, some of our elements would go into a chateau where they knew the Germans were, and they were sitting down to eat their food when, uh, when our guys would be out in the courtyard blasting them with machine guns and weapons and so forth. The Germans didn't even know that we could advance that fast. But that what was, casualties were you taking? We were taking very light casualties. My regiment took very light casualties. I don't know, God blessed us. But we, we, uh, we did not have heavy casualties in my unit. First of all, we had a very mobile type of mission a lot of times. We had a saying, not from cowardice, but if we ran into something that we did not want to engage in because they had 90 millimeter guns and we were outgunned, it'd be like a, a cruiser trying to fight a pocket battleship. We used to have a saying though, he who runs away today lives to fight another day. So we were very, our guys, and let me tell you about our kids. In my regiment, we had we had in our regiment, when we were at Fort Gordon, and we trained them, they were what we call inductees. Men, they didn't know their right foot from their left foot. Were these they were 17, 18? They were, they were 18 and 19 year old kids. 18, most of them were 18. They came from upstate New York. 
most of them were had from upstate New York had uh, ethnic backgrounds, Italian and Polish, and uh, a, a, several, uh, a, a little scattering of Jewish kids from an ethnic background. Uh, we also had the other element that came to the third cavity as inductees came from uh, the Illinois area, below Chicago, and they were from the Midwest. And it was a great mesh, and uh, you knew that these kids were not, not uh, regular soldiers, they were just young kids. We trained them. Uh, they learn how to fire machine guns, drive tanks, just do everything. They were marvelous kids, and they went overseas, and they fought beautifully. And we had inherited uh, the the colors in the tradition of the Third Cavalry. We were called the Brave Rifles, and. Uh, we kept inculcating in them, you're part of a tradition, you're part of a tradition. Some people say, well, that's a bunch of corn. It's not. These kids took to it, but they were a part of a great American tradition. They, they were, still yeah, they instilled pride. They were part of the United States Cavalry. We had a great tradition. And this was at a time when, when the ethnic boys probably ne had never even met farm boys. No, they had. They had not, and when they came down to Georgia, it was a real, it was a culture shock. Huh? It was a it was a real culture shock. Yeah. And they also in, inherited uh, in, inherited our banners, our our, uh, our our banners and everything. And there was a lots of jealousy between the old Third Cavalry, who now was a Third Tank Battalion, and they were at the same post, and they were old soldiers, and our young kids. And they had, really? yeah, they had uh, lots of, there was antagonism, you know, you, you guys come along and get our, get our campaign, uh, get all our old campaign ribbons, and we start a new outfit. It was a, you know, there was a lot upset about that. And um, how are these colors used? Well, in parades, we used the colors. It wasn't like the Civil War where you carried it, but the fact that you owned the flag and you owned the colors, and uh, I'll tell you later on a story about the colors that that was became part of uh, uh, American history that's been written up several times. I received a copy of it the other day on the, the magazine, Just World War II, and I'll tell you a little story about the colors, which is most interesting, because it had a feature article on it. It was called The Odyssey of the Colors. Well, while we're talking about the colors, maybe I should tell you, uh, the colors were captured by the Germans because we had two guys who always rode in a vehicle with a high silhouette. And these uh, were two guys who uh, were just coming up to see us. They were not co in combat. They were part of the supply system. And we used to tell them that vehicle has a high silhouette. And most of the time, all during that time, up until almost the, the battle, almost up to the time of the Battle of the, Bo the Bulge, it was a fluid situation. Our armor would clear the Germans from the roads, and they would go into the woods. And then you would be coming down the road after the Germans had gone into the woods. And now they would come back, and they would ambush you, and you were dead. And that happened on a, a, a number of occasions. Well, that's what happened to these guys. At the same time, now we, let, me, let me explain to you. We went helter-skelter uh, just in, in one month until we ran out of gas. We went to uh, Chateau, like I said, we went to Olia, uh, we went to uh, uh, south of Chartres, uh, we went to uh, Chateau Dun, went to Chateau Thierry. Chateau Thierry is in World War I where the Americans fought in the Argonne Forest and they spent uh, months and months in the Argonne Forest. The reason I tell you this story is we went through the Argonne Forest in 10 minutes. 
and 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 the uh, assistant uh, corps commander named Colonel Collier came to see us, and I was there next to him like I am next to you. And he pounded his fist and he said, looked at me, he says, you know what? You see that little patch of woods there? He said, I spent, I spent three months in that patch of woods dug in down there. He said, and you young bucks go through there in 10 minutes. He was kind of angry about it, you know. So it goes to show you the difference in wars sometimes. Theirs was a static situation. Ours was a, was a war of mobility and movement. And um, we ran out of gas. And we came to the Moselle River. And then we ran out of gas. Uh, in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, we had wreaked havoc with the Germans because we were way behind their lines. We had a group that went into Thionville, which the Germans called Diedenhofen, and they didn't even know that we were uh, our uh, there was uh, our troop was Troop B of the Third Squadron. They didn't even know that uh, our vehicles were American vehicles. They thought they were German vehicles. The German soldiers walking up and down the street. Uh, they just didn't realize that we could move that fast. How did they supply you with gasoline? Well, we didn't have gasoline at that time. That became a static situation. Most of the gasoline then went. Uh, General Patton begged for gasoline, and th th we were on a static situation. And the Third Army almost came to a dead stop. Nobody dreamt what well, well, the British would have in the newspapers. Monty moves two miles. You know, and the, uh, applauding what the Brits were doing. Not that they weren't good fighters. We were moving 50 and 60 miles. Now we come to the Moselle River, and we spend about 90 days in the Moselle. Um, what did you do all day? Well, we we wanted to make sure that there were no no counterattacks along the Moselle River. Uh, they would come into our area. Uh, we, uh, I had written an article for the Cavalry Journal on the defense of a river line. We, we used strong patrols. We used our tanks. Uh, we had uh, attached to us uh, about that time uh, later on, we had uh, 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 another artillery battalion. We had an engineer battalion. Uh, what was your gear like? What were you eating? <laughs> well, we were eating, uh, some of us were eating uh, deer meat that they had caught, but most of, our, most of us ate um, the rations, the K rations that they gave us, and we were used to that. We didn't have any mess, much, much of a mess, we didn't have a mess hall, anything like that. But we also worked with the ranger battalions, uh, the rangers had no mess hall either, and so they lived off the land. But we managed to make out about that. We we were supplied with army rations. This is long before the MREs. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, we established our headquarters in a beautiful French chateau called the Chateau de Hattange. But it was in the middle of our sector where we were all along the river holding that river line because we, no longer could we keep moving at that time until uh, the, the priority was given to most of the northern part of the invasion. And George Patton was very, very unhappy because he always wanted to be on the offense. And there we were on the defense. But I'll tell you what happened. We were in this beautiful chateau, and they had, we just established our headquarters there. That was the time then we, we could eat, you know. And our, our uh, philosophy was anybody can be miserable by sitting in the mud and digging foxholes. But if you didn't have to dig foxholes, and we did, we found out that more people were hurt by the elements than lots of times in my, by combat. 
And so we lived in this beautiful chateau for about 90 days. What was the weather like at this time? It was yeah. rainy. In November, it became real rainy. Uh, and it, the Moselle River at one time was like a Bull Creek in Columbus, Georgia, where you could walk across the creek. But after it started raining, it, they got, uh, it got to be a raging torrent. We knew we, uh, the Germans were on the other side of the river, and we were on, on the, we were on the western side of the river, they were on the eastern side of the river. Could you see their camp? We, we could see them moving around over there with our, uh, with our glasses, and they had some forts already there. Third Army felt like they had to destroy Metz because Metz, uh, in their opinion, stood in the way. Now, the story of Metz is very interesting. They're going to have a 60th anniversary of the fall of Metz, and uh, they're going to allow the Americans to come over there sometimes in August of this year. Of this year because it'll be the 60th anniversary of the fall of Metz. I think the Metz fell in about 1471, around the 15th century. It had never fallen since then uh, to force. Are you planning to go? I don't know. I really don't know right now. I hope you can get there for that. that well, most of, my, most of my old friends uh, uh, most of my old friends uh, in the 3rd Cavalry uh, uh, are dead, and uh, the officers that I knew. And I, I just don't know whether I, I, I want to go there or not. And uh, I'm not real happy with the French uh, right at this time. I really am not. So um, it's, um, it's some ambivalence right now. Well, now these people that you mentioned, um, did you remain friends for many, many years after the war? I have one that you served with. I have one right now who was an assistant of mine, named Tom Greenfield. He That's lives in wonderful. he lives in Tucson, Arizona. He played football with the Green Bay Packers. He was my assistant, and he was a big guy, about six foot four, six foot five, and uh, he had visited us in Columbus, Georgia. And he was a fine football player, and they assigned him to me. And whenever I put out a message, I would give it to him, and he would say, Hey, Chief, what are you doing giving me this damn message? And I'd say, Tom, I figure if a big damn dumb football player like you could read it and understand it, anybody in the <laughs> regiment could understand it. So I used him as a sounding board, and he'd laugh. But he was a very brave guy and a wonderful guy, and we were lifelong friends. And I have followed him from Missoula, Montana, to Yakima, Washington, to help him grow his... Um, they were buddies. We were great buddies. And now he's a very sick, and I talk to him all the time. He's out in uh, uh, Tucson, Arizona right now. I'm sorry. Yeah, but uh, my... But my regimental commander was a great soldier, the, the new one. The first regimental commander was shot up and captured en route near a little town called Gravelot, which was a very important town during the Fr Franco-Prussian War, 1871. And my colonel, my first colonel, had no business going up there. Uh, he, uh, uh, four colonels don't go on patrol. That's up to the lieutenants. And this was Colonel Drury. Yes, and he was shot up and captured and became a, a, what we call a Kriegsgefangenen, which is a POW. Now, this happened on September the 5th, 1944, and we lost our collars at the same time. So we got two reports. One, we got a report from, the, from these two guys who had no business riding that vehicle, uh, uh, not in a column, and, and was shot up and, and nearly captured. They came in they, with their clothes all torn and everything, and they told us, they said, and we had just heard that the colonel was captured, but in two different places, there were maybe 
40 miles apart. And uh, so when, after we found out about the colonel being captured, these two guys come in. And this was funny. They said, oh my God, the first thing they said, oh my God, we're going to be court-martialed. And we said, why? He said, uh, all of the colonel's clothes were in that vehicle that was captured. Oh. And the colonel is going to, he's just going to, he's going to court-martial us. And we all start laughing. We packed laughed and laughed until we rolled over on the floor. <laughs> and we said, You'll have to excuse the language. We said, you dumb bastards. Said, you know what? You know how lucky you are? The colonel's not going to need these clothes. Oh. He is now a prisoner of war. To which they said, thank God. Oh. <laughs> An article was written on the Odyssey of the Colors because a German general who commanded some of the troops said he captured the two guys said at the time they captured the two guys they also captured the colonel and the regimental colors it was a disgrace to lose the colors and not once did they move and by the way the colors were there so they placed so much emphasis on the colonel's clothes instead of the colors and it was funny to us you know and and they thought the general thought that the, those colors were in that vehicle and that's why they captured them and later on, after the war was over, I got a call from a, a man by the name of uh, Pierce Van, Van der Waal, Van der Waal uh, something like that. He um, was writing an article on the Odyssey of the Colors of the Third Cavalry. And he called me up because one of my squadron commanders said, Aaron Cohn can tell you the whole story. And I told him the story. I said, no, the colors were not in that vehicle. They were, they were in the vehicle, uh, the reconnaissance vehicle over here. And uh, when the colonel was captured, he was not there. He was way in another place. So there's a great article written on it. I've got, I've got it at home. I didn't bring it. Maybe I should have. Did the colonel survive the POW? Case? Yes, he did. He was a very nice man and everything. But um, uh, the, uh, our second regimental commander was young, virile. He uh, graduated West Point, class of 1933. And Jimmy Polk was a platoon leader under George Patton. He was from an old regular army family. His father was uh, Harding Polk, who was a roommate of George Patton's at one time. And, uh, and I think he was associated with at VMI. They were a very fine military family. And, uh, We're kind of short on time, so could you go ahead and tell us how, how did you get across the Moselle River? Well, this was this is this is the way that we got across the Moselle River. You see, the uh, Metz was uh, defended by these forts. They were uh, Metz was. Metz was defended by the forts uh, like Fort Drion, Fort Plapaville, and the Third Army uh, butt their head up against there, and the, the, it, they were defended by an OCS class. It was uh, an OCS class who was in Metz as we approached Metz, and um, I, we were we were north of Metz, and the Fifth Division. Uh, tried to take it, and it, it, there were subterranean tunnels and everything, and it was just no soap. They couldn't do it. So George Patton decided, along with the advice of his staff, to handle it this way. We we uh, established a cavalry screen, uh, 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 and behind the cavalry screen, uh, we did, made, did a great job in keeping the Germans from finding out what was going on. We, we had the 90th Division up north. We had the 95th Division uh, down, uh, and, the, and we, also, uh, we also had the, uh, we had the 90th Division behind us. We, they didn't know, the Germans didn't know we had them there. We put the 10th Armored Division in reserve, and the 95th Division uh, north of Metz, and then, of course, the 5th south of Metz. We, then we had the crossing. We crossed the river. I 
after we crossed the river, uh, we uh, exploited the, uh, what we had done along with the 10th Armored Division and we, the, uh, the Corps and the Army intentionally left an east-west road for Metz because they know the Germans when they found out they were being surrounded they were going to withdraw. They withdrew. We had knocked a Luftwaffe out of the sky, our Air Force did. They did a magnificent job. So the Germans didn't have any air cover, and it was like a Turkey shoot because the 19th uh, t uh, t uh, Air Force, uh, uh, General Opie Wilder was a, was a general I remember, and for about, you know, I don't know how many miles, all you could see was dead horses and dead Germans all along the way. And once we crossed the Moselle, then we had uh, hard fighting along the Palatinate. Uh, in the German, uh, what we call the Switch Line. That was uh, where they had the dragon's teeth and everything. How long did that go on? Well, that went on uh, until basically, uh, well, I know we crossed the Rhine River in, in March. We, little by little, we uh, edged our way, but we didn't do like we did before. We suffered more casualties. Uh, but we fought uh, in the Palatinate, we call the Palatinate, and uh, went through Kaiserslautern, and, and we crossed the Rhine at, um, I know you want to save time, but we, we crossed the Rhine at uh, Ludwigshagen, near Frankfurt. And we crossed on, I remember crossing the Rhine on my birthday, on March, really? March the 3rd. So you just and recently that. had a birthday and you were 88. And well, yeah, that's right. And Nine. you're still a sitting judge? Yes, yes. In the juvenile court? For 40 years. That's wonderful. So we, um, we crossed the Rhine and we, we, the beautiful thing that happened, the 9th Infantry Division, who uh, came in our command post and said, boy, we'd be glad when we get into the fight. And they were the ones who captured the Remagen Bridge, which was one of the greatest things that ever happened. But I'll never forget when they were rookies and they came in there They said, we, we can't wait to get in the fight. And my buddy Tom Greenfield had a saying and said, take me out, coach. I've had enough. He was an ex-football player. So, I remember seeing a movie about that bridge. Yeah, that bridge was hard fought. And of course, that was going on north of us, but we crossed the Rhine on, on pontoons, a pontoon bridge. Really? And we had no problem. Uh, they said Montgomery had all of his artillery lined up, you know, like, like he always did with everything. And they got across and we just crossed with no, no problem at all. And uh, then from then on, it was, we ran like we did in August. And how far did you penetrate? Well, we went, we went through, uh, we headed southeast. Uh, we went to Weimar, er Erfurt, Erfurt, Weimar, uh, Leipzig, and we headed to, we were told to head towards the southeast. And we approached a Regensburg, Germany. That's uh, a beautiful area. Yeah. I've got to tell you one story about that because it's so apropos. When I was at University of Georgia, my hero was a major by the name of Jack Holt. And, uh, you know, he was regular army and breeches and boots and the whole works. And I was just a rookie. And uh, uh, I, I didn't know what happened to him. And then I found out uh, later on uh, we, there was a column coming up. We had, we had crossed the bridge, the bridge at Regensburg. We, uh, General Polk had told, uh, I mean, Colonel, uh, General Patton had told Colonel Polk, Jimmy, if you uh, uh, capture that bridge, I'll make a general out of you. And we had the 5th Ranger Battalion, and they got on, they loved to be with us. They put them on tags, and like cowboys and Indians, they went on down to Regensburg, and just as they got there, the Germans blew the bridge. Jimmy later on became a general when he came home. But we laughed about that. Well, and then all of a sudden, I'm sorry, Jim yeah, who? Uh, Jim who? Jimmy Polk okay. was my regimental commander. He later became a four-star general. He was a magnificent colonel. Uh, he and I had a great relationship, and I have a relationship with his family today. He died of uh, cancer, and I went down to see him before he died. Uh, it was real sad. 
a, um, sure it was. I, I'll tell you a great, just one story. Uh, Jimmy Polk inherited me, and I was at the map working, and he said, uh, who the hell are you? And I said, I'm your S3, because I figured he was a West Point, he was going to get some of his West Point friends in, and I was going to lose my job. <laughs> and he just grunted, huh? And then about five minutes later, he said, I want a five paragraph field order. Can you do it? I said, yes, sir. I'm a Leavenworth graduate, and I did it. He just looked at me. For 30 days and 30 nights, he worked me over. He worked me over like I'd never been worked over. And I thought the man had no compassion or no heart. Uh, he was just a, a, a regular army soldier, and he was tough as steel. And uh, we had a relief, the 83rd Division relieved us along the Moselle River at the time. And uh, I handled the relief, and I noticed him looking at me at the corner of uh, his eye. And after the relief was over, we were walking in this little uh, village, and all of a sudden this guy reaches over, grabs me, puts his arms around my neck, and hugs me like you would hug a lover and say, Aaron Cohn, you belong to me, and I'll never let you go. Well, I paid him back. He <coughs> passed his test. Yeah, and we became lifelong friends. And, and, and then, of course, I paid him back because there was a requisition for a field grade officer who had combat uh, to be a staff judge, a, be a judge, a law member, and the judge advocate and had experience with that. It was just made for me. And Jimmy Polk says, well, here's your ticket to the rear. You'd better go take it because you got a chance to go. And I looked at and and I, I just took it and I just tore it up and I said. You did? I said, I never told my wife that. I said, you know, <laughs> you know, I would never, I would never leave you, Colonel Polk. Never. And I didn't, didn't leave him. So I paid him back. And uh, we, uh, we ended up way down. I want to take a break. Because when you feel like you need to finish your sentences, you're thinking so fast that you've got your eyes closed part of the time. So I just wanted to say that you don't like to take any direction. Should I take a break? Okay. No, no, I'm fine. You don't take a break, but, but when you're concentrating so hard, your eyes are closed for quite a long right. time. I just wanted to tell you that because you always look so good on camera. Oh, thank you, darling. Yes. Thank you, darling. Yes. Are y'all ready to go? Yeah. Well, we've got, what, five more minutes? minutes? No. Well, you, oh, I'm okay. He meant you're ready to start rolling again. I know, like but I we're still I, rolling. I think, oh. We're still rolling. Okay, go ahead. Well, you know, we were headed to the southeast, and we could tell that the war was about over. And uh, we ended up in the... Uh, uh, we ended up in the in the Austrian Alp country, but uh, two about two weeks before the the war ended, we ran into the concentration camp in Ebensee, Austria, and of course uh, there uh, was a very emotional uh, impact on me when I saw uh, what ha what the concentration camps were. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, except I was a personal liberator, and when they saw me and I identified myself, the, uh, they hugged me and loved me and kissed me as their liberator, and it left a great impact on my life. Uh, then, of course, um, we received orders to cross the Alps because they thought Tito and his guerrillas were coming up through the Alp country uh, and into Yugoslavia. And my, like Hannibal, my unit crossed the Alps. Remember I told you about horses? Yes. And one day, uh, we were on a road, sitting on a road, a little dirt road, and to the right of us was a gorge of about 2,000 feet, and to the left of us was the hills like the Golan Heights. They went straight up like that. And I said to myself, and we were talking about it, Tito and his guerrillas, if they had horses and they wanted to attack us, all they had to do was get up on that high ground and we'd all be dead. So that shows you it's the terrain that you're in. And that was bad terrain for us. Luckily, we ran into the British Eighth Army coming up from Italy. And um, 
I'll tell you one story before I say I'm, I'm through. We ended up the war. They told us to come on back. And we ended up the war at a beautiful place called Gmunden. And that night we had, uh, we waited till the Japanese surrendered, and then we had a celebration with what we call atomic punch. We put sliver of hits, whiskey, everything you want to. And I mean, there was a, a crowd that was just so happy and everything. Well, that's a new drink on me. That yeah. That sounds like a very jubilant evening. Yeah. But we, um, so I think things are one story I need to tell you because it shows you the difference in, uh, in, in cultures. Um, when we were, met the British Eighth Army coming up from Italy, there was a German major that came through our area riding on a horse as if he were Alexander the Great. And oh, I had a friend, well, he was riding right through our area. Of course, the British had let him do it. They gave him the permission. I had a friend of mine named Jimmy Gray, and Jimmy Gray said in his atrocious German, a rouse from the fair, which means get off the horse. This uh, German major said in beautiful English, I'll have you know, sir, the British commander has given me my personal mount, and I am permitted to ride. And Jimmy Gray said, I don't give a damn what the British say. This is General Patton's Third Army, and we don't allow people that we have fought and conquered to ride through here like you conquered us. Get your ass off that horse, or I'll blow you off the horse. Whereupon he got off the horse then, and he left a beautiful horse, and Jimmy Gray, his father had sold horses, my father sold horses, and he called me up and said, Major Cohen, I've got the prettiest horse you've ever seen. Two hours later, so I was a knock on our door, and uh, I went to the door of the command post that we were in, and that was a, a, a British uh, a, lieut a lieutenant, and he said, uh, I said, what do you want, lieutenant, lieutenant? And he said, my colonel wants your colonel to come over. He wants to talk to him. And I said, and what is the rank of your colonel? He said, a lieutenant colonel. And I said, well, my colonel is a full American Eagle colonel. So you can tell your colonel to come see my colonel, because that's the way the Brits are. So Jimmy Polk hollered, what's going on, Aaron? And I told him, he said, go over and see what's going on. Well, I went over there, and they were having tea at four in the afternoon. Of course. I went there. They let me sit there and sit there and sit there, and I was angry anyways by the time he got to me. And this British colonel says, you know, you chaps are mucking things up. That's a British expression, mucking things up. We specifically said that that colonel, that that major could keep this, his, his mount. And I said, Colonel, let me explain something to you. We are a citizen's army. We are not regular troops. We came over here to fight this war. We won the damn war. And it wasn't like a soccer game to us because the British soldiers and the German girls were all up in there uh, going up into the hills together. And I said, um, uh, we, don't, we don't allow enemy to ride through our area like that. Maybe you do, but we don't. And we're not going to change a thing. But we fought this war. We won it. And all we want to do now is to go home. You understand how we are? Because they were treat, he was treating me like I was a colonial, and he was a, a British uh, lobster bag, you know. Yes, sir. And so I told him Steve off, man. told him off, and uh, and Jimmy Polk. I told Jimmy Polk about. It. He laughed and said, "Good for you." And that was the end of that. But that shows you the difference between the way they were and the way we were. The war was over. No, uh, we we had no fraternization at the time, uh, and the Brits were already going up into the hills with the girls. And how did you get home? How did I get home to the States? Yes, sir. I came home on an LST. Now, what is that? It was a kind of a light ship, you know, not a big ship. It was a, a Navy ship. It was very, wasn't big. And where did you sail from? I sailed from uh, uh, Southampton, 
for I always sell from uh, sell from no I sell from Marseille. I, I sailed from Marseille. And how uh, did you get from Germany back to Marseille? Well, I, 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 well, uh, we had vehicles going around uh, called American vehicles. So were you sort of on your own at this point? Yeah, I was sort of on, but I was. I had a lot of high points. You came home on high points, and I came home on high points, and I sailed out of Marseille. And did I, you stay in the service? Um, I stayed in the Army Reserve. I, I left the army as a lieutenant colonel, uh, I, I, and I, I got um, I stayed in the army reserve, and I would go on active duty every summer, and I had 27 years service before I was through, and uh, I received an appointment to the juvenile court, and just about the same day, I received a letter from the Department of Defense that I was in the zone of consideration for promotion to brigadier general. I did not know whether I, 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 at that time I, I had my, my hands full with the court and raising my children and, and raising my family and I knew I'd have to go to the Army War College and I just felt like, look, you know, I can't be everything to everybody and I thought my family uh, came first in uh, my court. Leslie, he graduated University of Georgia, also uh, law school in Birmingham, Alabama at Sanford University in Cumberland Law School. And then the youngest one is Jane. She graduated University of South Carolina at the age of 40 uh, because uh, her husband was a doctor and she was working. She helped. She did a fine job. She helped send her husband to uh, medical school. And, but d deep down, I think uh, they're all bulldogs. I was a bulldog also. I was yeah. At the University of Georgia. Great. Did you happen to keep a, a diary during any of this time? No. There wasn't much time. No. Uh, I, I kept no diary. Uh, they, there was a historical uh, after action report that I'm sure this is in Washington now. But I kept no diary. I didn't have time for a diary. I really didn't. You know, when nighttime came and I got a chance to get my sleeping bag. Uh, you know, this Veterans History Project is, um, is, is being done by the Library of Congress, uh, the American Folklife Center, although some of the transcripts may be kept here in Georgia for Georgians to see. And we really appreciate this wonderful memory. You have a... a a wonderful recollection of everything and I know that you could speak for hours more. We do have some pictures that we want to um, copy and, and add to your your memories and um, if, if Gail would like to say anything I'd love for her too. She's in the room today. I'm thinking. Um, I I I guess the only thing that I would like to say is that um, I think that what the Atlanta History Center is doing to preserve the history of the Second World War is extremely important and that I've always been very proud of my dad. Oh, whatever, just did, so please don't roll the camera anymore. But one of the things I did want to say, we can piece it a little bit more is I grew up with a tremendous, um, I grew up, what in the world is the matter with me all of a sudden? It's a very emotional time. I, I think that what I want to say is that I grew up with a tremendous um, love for my country, a love for my community, and a love of history. And that love of community and that love of history and that love of my country really came directly from my dad. And um, it was very interesting to me, though, that dad did not talk in very great detail about the liberation of the concentration camp heavensy because the stories that I did get to hear over the years about what those camps really did look like and what they really were about is also an incredible piece of history. And uh, I don't know if you told the story 
um, about the liberation of Luxembourg. But no. They did. They did liberate Luxembourg. They did liberate the concentration camp of Eds, and um, they actually returned. Yeah. I went back with General Polk in 1987, 1978. We went back to be decorated by the Luxembourg government. I didn't put that down as a decoration. But. Well, we will need to, to find out about your, med he does your have citations and medals. You didn't put that down, Daddy. Next time you ask me to say something, I'll be able to say something without. I, it was no special medal. They just gave me a, a you know, um, just a citation. Or is there anything else that you would like to add that we've not covered? No, uh, like I said, uh, um, this, you know, I, I have no talent for. Uh, I, I, I didn't go to Georgia Tech. I mean, you, you you show me something. My wife says the only thing I know how to do is pull the shades. I mean, you know, I'm strictly academic, and I love history. To me, if I had not gone to law school, I would have majored in history and taught history. But uh, what was fascinating is, like in Trier, Germany, there is a bridge called the Romans built, and it's still there. And when we cross a bridge, sometimes if I could stop, I could, in Austria, you could see that there is a bridge that was built by um, Emperor Franz Joseph, because he was, you know, uh, he had one of the longest reigns in history from, I think, um, about 1848 or something like that to uh, 1916. It was a long, a long reign. But uh, I, I love to see. Covered a lot of history during that one war. Well, you, you know, we 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 learn we learn from history. We learn from history, and uh, you know, in the Columbus High School, I took four years of Latin, which which I loved. You forced me to do the same thing. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Europe is, uh, right now I noticed the Slovenes are mad at somebody, be, you know, they have, they have all their ethnic groups and they hate each other and I came home and I told my family, I said, they'll always have problems in Europe and I'm particularly at this time. And you're right, there's still many more. Yeah, I'm particularly, there, I'm particularly, controlling. yeah, I'm com I'm particularly, uh, uh, I don't mind telling you, I'm particularly unhappy with the French and their anti-Semitism now, after all these years. And after we liberated them, not once, but twice. Yeah. Well, they went through that with the Dreyfus case a long time ago. But uh, the French, they're not doing this right. Well, we really do thank you very much for speaking with us today. My pleasure, Lynn.